I, uh, I prayed for you this morning. I sat where you sat all the years growing up. 26 years, obviously, I was not sitting in a church service <clears throat> for all that time. But uh, I sat and I heard messages and I uh, even made a mental ascent and said, yeah, I believe that. But the Bible says that the demons believe. They believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They believe that he died on the cross. They believe that he rose from the dead. And the Bible says they do something more than you and I do. They, the Bible says that they believed and they tremble because they know for a fact who Jesus was, what he did, and they know their time is running out. And I prayed this morning because only God and you know the moment you take your last breath where you're going. I can tell you it's one of two places. It's heaven and hell, heaven or hell. And I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that I want you to know that you're going to heaven. And I'm going to tell you the truth this morning about the fact of what Jesus did. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. Nobody put him on the cross. He could have called 10,000 angels. But he went to the cross. And the reason he went to the cross is that you and I were born sinners by nature. And if nothing was done about that, you and I would die and split hell wide open and spend forever in hell where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and the pain and the agony beyond human comprehensive. You see, hell was not created for men. Hell was created by God for Satan and the fallen angels. But you're going to go there, and I was going to go there until we came to grips with what God said about how we could get to heaven. I know there are people that will tell you that there's many roads to heaven. Well, there were many roads to Rome, but I can tell you there's only one way to heaven. Jesus said it this way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Jesus lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. There was, he was buried. But now listen carefully. All of that is null and void if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. That's what I'm going to deal with today. I'm going to tell you the truth. If you're our guest, when you receive the bulletin this morning, if you'll open it up, there are the notes, and I would encourage you to follow along and to get a pen or a pencil and, and to fill in as we go. I begin in your notes with one introductory statement, and that is this. Christianity stands or falls with the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Christianity stands or falls with the bodily resurrection of Jesus. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. In other words, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I'm an idiot for what I'm doing. I've got nothing to say, and anything I say is just void, and your faith is also empty. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and listen to this, you are still in your sins. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you and I are still in our sin. The British philosopher, C.E.M. Joad, was asked a question. A guy said, Dr. Jode, if you could answer, if you could ask one question and be sure of getting the right answer, what would it be? And without hesitation, C.E.M. Jode said, did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? I'm going to give you three statements this morning. They're the truth about the resurrection. The first statement, the first statement is this, number one. His resurrection was physical in nature. His resurrection was physical in nature. 
in, the Bible, in Acts chapter 13, the Bible says, <clears throat> now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. Folks, we're told over and over <clears throat> and over in the New Testament that Jesus rose from the dead physically, bodily resurrection. Let me say four things. First of all, the disciples, after Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples held his feet, Matthew chapter 28. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Secondly, he ate food after he rose from the dead. In Luke 24, the Bible says, so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Thirdly, he showed the disciples his wounds. John 20 said that Jesus showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And fourthly, he was flesh and bones. In Luke 24, Jesus said, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you can see. His was a literal, physical, bodily resurrection. That's the first truth, truth I want you to understand about the rec- resurrection. He rose, there was a bodily resurrection. He rose physically from the dead. Number two, his resurrection has convincing proofs. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, Luke wrote, speaking of Jesus, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. When I was a kid, you know, I, my voice was absolutely crystal clear and smooth before I got up here. And I can tell you what's happening. I, I, I absolutely firmly believe. Satan doesn't want you to hear this message. He's wanting to distract you, and you're just going to have to uh, bear through this, and I'm going to turn my mic off just for a moment. And... Uh, That didn't help at all, did it? (laughs) But he doesn't want you to hear this message. Because the truth is, he he doesn't give a flip about you and me. He hates God. You know how you could get at me worse than any other way? Is go after my kids. You know that as a parent. And God... Send his son to the cross because he wants you and me to spend eternity with him. His resurrection had convincing proofs. When I was a kid, uh, there was a TV a series entitled Perry Mason. And I loved Perry Mason. Every Saturday night, I would watch Perry Mason with my, my dad and uh, my mom. And uh, he would get all the evidence and he was, you just... You know, how's he going to do all of, all of this? I was fascinated. I still, Deb and I today, we, we love to watch mysteries and kind of think through all that stuff. A number of years ago, I came across some actual questions that lawyers uh, asked uh, during trials. And it, uh, it, these were taken from official court transcripts. I'm not making any of these up. Let me get, just give you a few. A lawyer asked, he said, now, doctor, when the doctor was on the witness stand, now, doctor, isn't it true when a person dies in his sleep, in most cases, he just passes quietly away and doesn't know anything about it until the next morning? (laughs) Another one, the attorney asked a guy on the witness stand, he says, was it you or your brother that was killed in the war? (laughs) I could read a bunch of them, and they, they they get a lot better, but the classic to me was, a lawyer was uh, uh, examining uh, on the witness stand a, a medical examiner. And uh, he asked the medical examiner, 
examiner. He said, do you recall approximately the time that you examined, uh, you examined the body of Mr. Eddington at the Rose chapter, Chapel? And the medical examiner said, it was in the evening. The autopsy started about 8.30 p.m. The attorney said, and Mr. Eddington was dead at the time, is that correct? <laughs> and the medical examiner said, no, he was sitting on the table wondering why I was doing an autopsy. <laughs> That's true. That's right from official court transcripts. I hope I do a better job than, uh, than that this morning because I want to present the case for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself claimed that he would rise bodily. Matthew chapter 16. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. In Matthew, Matthew 17, now, they were, <clears throat> now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus said, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. And then in Matthew 26, Jesus said, But after I have been raised, I will go before or ahead of you to Galilee. There are infallible proofs. The, the, the word infallible uh, proofs, it's, it literally means convincing proofs or a sure sign. The, it's a legal term that refers to conclusive evidence that would hold up in a court of law. Let me give you some of these. First of all, number one, his death. Obviously, before he came back from the dead, he had to die. There have been many attacks at the death of Jesus Christ. One of them uh, that has, uh, <clears throat> that number of years ago caught a groundswell was what they call the swoon theory. In other words, they said that Jesus didn't die on the cross, that he fainted, uh, perhaps by the shock, and uh, he got unconscious, uh, and he was in a state of unconsciousness, but he didn't die. Everybody just thought he died. And when they took him into the tomb, the cool air resuscitated, uh, revived him. In other words, there's no resurrection. It, it was a resuscitation. Well, there's several, several problems with that line of thinking. Just to make sure Jesus was dead, the Bible says in John 19, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. He took that spear and he thrust it between the ribs and he punctured that sack around the heart as well as the heart causing a water-like fluid and blood to come out. I came across in an article by the Journal of American Medical Association and I put it in your box, in your notes in that box. The Journal of American Medical Association said, Clearly, the way that historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was afflicted and supports the traditional view that the spear probably perforated not only the right lung, but also the pericardium and heart, and thereby ensured his death. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Listen, the thrust of the spear in Jesus' side didn't cause his death. It confirmed his death. Number two, second convincing evidence is the burial of his body. The burial of his body. And I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. There's a third convincing evidence and that is the fact that the tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. I don't know if you realize this, 
But one thing that has never been disputed in almost 2,000 years is on that first Easter morning, that Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. The Roman guards reported to the chief priest that the body of Jesus was missing. In Matthew chapter 28, the Bible says, when they had assembled the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them. His disciples came at night and stole him uh, away while we slept. In other words, immediately there was a cover-up. Their response was to try and explain away the resurrection of Jesus. And that's been happening now for almost 2,000 years. Now think about it. Think about how absurd that cover-up was. The guards were told to spread the story that the body of Jesus was stolen by the disciples while the guards slept. I don't know of any court that would allow a witness to give evidence about something that happened while they were sleeping. I put two things in your notes. Either man got him out of the grave or God took him out. Either man got him out of the grave or God took him out. And secondly, if human beings took his body from the tomb, then there are only two options. There can only be two options, his friends or his enemies. But if if his friends took his body, there are three obstacles to his friends stealing the body. Listen carefully. Number one, the first obstacle, the soldiers. The soldiers that they put to guard were like our special ops. They were the best Roman soldiers. They're special forces. First thing I want to say about this is that according to Roman military records, if a guard fell asleep while he was on watch, he would immediately be put to death. They just didn't sin. You know, when I, I can remember reading this passage uh, uh, or listening to it, and I mean, when I was a kid and even growing up, and you, know, you see plays and the soldiers, you know, they on the tomb, they had one on each side of the tomb, you know, in the play, and they were normally skinny guys, and they had a sword up here, and, and you know, they just looked like they couldn't protect anything. That's not how it was. When the Roman government put a watch, or they guarded something carefully, they would anywhere from 16 to 60 soldiers would be, uh, would be sent. So let's just say the the minimum were sent to guard the tomb where Jesus was, uh, was buried. What they did is they put four in front of the tomb, they put four to each side, and they put four in the rear of the tomb. Each one of those guards had a six-foot six foot spear, a three-foot sword, a dagger on one side, and a shield, a shield uh, on, a, on the other. The second thing I want you to know is that in order for the disciples to come and steal the body, all of the soldiers had to fall asleep at the same time. And thirdly, even if they fell asleep, how in the world would the disciples manage to get past the soldiers, break open the seal, roll away that huge stone, and make off with the body without disturbing, disturbing one of the guards? That's a far stretch from the disciples three days earlier that had a yellow streak down the back, uh, down their back about a mile wide, and they ran like cowards, but now they come back in an attempt to overpower the Roman guards. The second obstacle, there was first the soldiers, the second obstacle was the stone. That stone, if you've ever been to Israel, you'll see what they, that stone wasn't just a, a little stone or something. It weighed a number of tons. And what it would do is they would put it on an incline where they would roll it down and it would get over the, uh, 
uh, the entrance to the, to the tomb. Modern scientists said that it probably would take up to 20 men to just move the stone up a few feet. There was a third obstacle, and that was the seal. After that stone was put in place, it was sealed with sealing wax, and it was stamped with the Roman signet, which simply meant that the entire power of the most powerful government in the world, the Roman Empire, was behind it. Don't touch it. And the soldiers knew this, that if that seal was broken while they were asleep on the watch, they would be burned alive with their clothes on. I put in your notes in that box. This leaves only one group, the enemies. If his enemies took the body, why didn't they produce it? Instead of having Christians arrested, flogged, imprisoned, and killed, all that was necessary to halt the spread of Christianity dead in its tracks was to produce the body. There's only one reason they didn't produce the body. They didn't have the body. Now, I told you I wanted to come back to the burial of his body. Because in the 20th chapter of John, it gives us the sequence of events of what happened that Sunday morning. The first individual to get to the tomb was Mary Magdalene. And when she got there, the stone had been rolled away. The body was not in there. And she ran and she went to a couple of the disciples, Peter and John, and told them what had happened. And Peter and John took off. Well, John got to the tomb first. And the Bible says that when he got to the tomb, he saw the linen clothes lying there. He didn't go into the tomb. He just kind of stooped over and looked in. And the Bible says that he saw the linen clothes lying there. Peter was behind him, and he just goes right past John into the tomb. And the Bible says that Peter saw the linen clothes lying there. But then the Bible tells us that John went into the tomb himself and that he saw and he believed. What's interesting is that those are three different Greek words for the same English word. When the, you know, all the disciples, all the disciples uh, who saw the Lord believed However, John was the first one to believe, and he believed before he ever saw Jesus. And the question is, what made him believe? In order to understand what happened when John and Peter got to the tomb, you, you really must understand in that day the burial procedure of the Jewish community. In Egypt, they embalmed. Rome and Greece, they cremated. But in Palestine, they neither embalmed nor did they cremate. cremate. But rather, they would wrap the body in linen and put dry spices with it and put it face up with no coffin in a tomb cut out of the rock of the Judean or Galilean hillside. You can see them today. Another unique factor of the Jewish burial that's very helpful to understand what happened in John's account of the resurrection is that there was one common denominator. Whether you were rich or whether you were poor, and that all bodies were wrapped in linen. However, the face and the neck were bare. But the upper part of the head, there was linen cloth that would be wrapped around, and it would look like a turban. When Jesus was taken off the cross, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea took his body and they buried Jesus. But they had to prepare it for burial. The body was removed from the cross before the Jewish Sabbath. It was washed and then it was wrapped with the linen bands. A hundred pounds of spices would be used and they would be carefully impacted between each layer of the wrapping of the linen cloth, the dry spices, aloes, and myrrh. 
Jesus' body was encased with these. However, his head was left bare. The linen cloth was wrapped in the upper part in the shape of like a turban, and the body was placed in the tomb until that first Easter morning. When Jesus was resurrected, what happened to the, the grave clothes? The linen cloths collapsed. They collapsed by the weight of the spices, and they were lying there undisturbed. But the cloth around his head had no spices, and they maintained the shape. And they would have been laid in a separate, separate from the body by the space of the neck, the Lord's neck, and his face. The Bible says that when John got there, he stooped over, looked in, and he just saw. That's what that word meant in the Greek. When Peter got there, he went in, and the Greek word for our English word saw that he used is that he viewed attentively. But when John went in, the word that is used is that he saw with understanding. John Scott, in his book, Basic Christianity, said, a glance at these grave clothes proved the reality that indicated the nature of the resurrection. Can you imagine what that was? John gets there. He stoops over, looks in, and he just saw, just looked. Peter goes in, and he sees attentively, but the Bible says that when John went in, he saw with understanding. He knew that Jesus had risen from the dead. The linen cloths over his body with that hundred pounds of spices, had collapsed. And then the wrapping around Jesus' head was in a place by itself, the distance of the neck and face of Jesus, and it hadn't collapsed. And when John saw that, he believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. But there's a fourth there's a fourth convincing proof, and that is changed lives. Changed lives. Folks, when Jesus was on the cross and he was crucified, the disciples took off. They're scared to death. Jesus had died. They didn't, they didn't think that he was going to rise from the dead. But there was a dramatic change in the disciples. Just listen, follow with me. You know, men may die for convictions, but men will not die. People don't die when they, they know it's a concoction. What happened turned those disillusioned cowards into willing martyrs. Before Easter... They were dejected. They thought Jesus had died. He was hiding behind. They were hiding behind closed doors, scared for their lives. But Jesus had already risen from the dead. They didn't know that, that he was going to rise. After Jesus rose from the dead, on 10 different occasions, he appeared to individuals. 500, over 500, 516 people during a period of around six weeks. He appeared in the morning. He appeared at noon. In the afternoon, he appeared in the evening. He appeared indoors. He appeared out of doors. But these disciples that followed Jesus for three years, they were scared to death. But something happened in their lives that turned them from cowards to ultimately being a willing martyr because they knew that Jesus had risen from the dead. They knew. They saw him. Just listen to what happened to them. 
James, the half-brother of Jesus, who before the resurrection did not believe that his half-brother, same mother, different father. Jesus was born of a virgin. James didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But after the resurrection, he put his faith and knew that Jesus was the son of the living God. And he followed him. James was beheaded. Peter was crucified on a cross. And before they crucified him, he asked if they would crucify him upside down because he did not deserve to be crucified like his Savior. Matthew was martyred with a sword. James, another James, the brother of John, was beheaded. By the way, the half-brother of Jesus... You know, how he, you know how he died? He was thrown off the southeastern pinnacle of the temple, 100 feet down. Why? Because he refused to deny his faith that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. Bartholomew and Nathaniel were whipped to death. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross after he was whipped by seven soldiers. Thomas had a spear thrust in him, and he was burned in an oven. Matthias was stoned and beheaded. Paul was tortured and beheaded. Dr. Daniel Aiken, a former president of the Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, said, and I quote, something happened that caused the followers of Jesus to believe they had real and genuine encounters with the risen Lord. These encounters with Jesus changed them from timid and fearful cowards to bold and courageous witnesses of the resurrected Christ. In addition, each of the disciples, with the possible exception of John, died the death of a martyr, and each of them died alone, and yet died still proclaiming Jesus as the risen Lord with their dying breath. There's not a one of them that would have been willing to die if they did not know that Jesus had risen from the dead. This thing of Easter Sunday that represents the resurrection is just not something that's nice. It represents, without it, Christianity. You and me getting to heaven falls null and void. But there's one more thing truth I want to tell you about the resurrection, and that is number three, his resurrection was a necessity. It was a necessity. Let me say two things of why it was necessary. Number one, his resurrection was necessary to have my sins forgiven. Look at this verse, Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Speaking of Jesus, he was delivered up for our sins and he was raised for our justification. In other words, he went to the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. But if he doesn't rise from the dead, that death on the cross doesn't matter. But he rose for our justification. And that word justification simply means just as if I'd never sinned. Jesus rose from the dead so you and I could come into a living relationship with the God of this universe and have our sin forgiven. Imagine that. All of our sin forgiven. His resurrection was necessary to have my sins forgiven. And secondly, his resurrection was necessary to receive eternal life. Folks, don't miss what I'm about to say. You can't receive eternal life and you can't go to heaven unless Jesus was raised from the dead and you believe he was and you receive him as Lord. Romans 10, 9 says this. Look here. If you confess with your mouth 
that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you do that, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved and you say, Ken, I, uh, I believe. For the first time in my life, I really do believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. After today's message, I believe that God, he was raised from the dead. But Ken, you don't know me. That's true. I don't. I know me. I knew what I was like. I knew things about me that no one else knew. But you say, Ken, you don't know me. If I came and opened up my life and told you, there's no way in the world somebody as wicked as I am could get to heaven. Yes, you can. That's a lie from the devil. But maybe on the other end, you're saying, but I'm good enough to get to heaven. I'm a good guy. I'm a good lady. I mean, I, I, I'm religious. I go to church. I, I believe that stuff. But you've never come to a point in your time in your life, where that mental ascent, folks, I lived this way. I, I had a mental ascent to a body of doctrine, of truth. But it was until I was 26 years of age, my life wasn't a mess. I just came under conviction, and I knew that if I died, I was going to hell, and I didn't want to do that. And Jesus died and paid the penalty of my sins. And God raised him from the dead so that I could have my sin forgiven. It doesn't matter how good you are or how bad you are. Here's the deal. All of us are born into this world a sinner by nature. And the only way that sin can be properly dealt with and forgiven is if Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead... And you and I confess him as our Savior. Ask him to come into our life and believe that God raised him from the dead. I don't care who you are. I know what my Bible says. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. I love this verse. Whoever, say the word whoever. <laughs> that includes you and me. I don't care how good you think you are. I don't care how rotten or bad you think you are. That includes us. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, not might be, not will hope to be, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you draw your last breath, you're going to one of two places. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. And that is totally dependent on your choice. Heaven or hell? Eternity with God in heaven where there's no death, no sorrow, none of the junk that we deal with every day of our life. Or hell, eternal torment. It's your choice. I remember that Tuesday morning, the battle in my life. And I came to the place to where I believed God. And in my bedroom by myself, Deb had gone to work. I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. I believe that he was who he said he was. 
and I believe that he died on the cross for my sin. I believe that God raised him from the dead. And I believe that God would forgive me of all of my sins, though I have no clue why he loved me when there were things about myself I sure didn't love. But he did. I don't remember the words I said. Truth is, if I didn't say anything, but I just in my heart just said, Lord, I believe, not here, but here, he would have saved me. Here's what I want to do. I don't want you to leave questioning your eternal destiny. If you want to choose to walk out of here like I used to do, stiff-arming politely, God, that's your prerogative. I hope you don't. Because you have no assurance that you'll have another opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ. I hope that you walk out of here today absolutely knowing that you're sinner forgiven. Not based on how you feel, but based on what God said. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here's what I want to do. In just a moment, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. But now listen, forget anyone's here. This is between you and God. I will lead you in that prayer. I will pray where you can hear it. You pray just between God and you. And if you pray and you are sincere on the authority of God's word, listen, he will hear your prayer. He will forgive you of your sin. And he'll bring you into his forever family. And tonight, you can put your head on your pillow and you can know I'm on my way to heaven. Jesus paid it all. Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you say, Ken, I'm not... I'm not absolutely certain that if I died, I'm going to heaven, but I want to know. Then I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Like I said, I'll pray out loud. You pray just between God and you. Let me lead you. Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Thank you for loving me, God. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. Thank you that he rose from the dead. And this very moment, I open my heart to Jesus. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I receive you this very moment as my Savior and as my Lord. I'm trusting nothing and nobody but you, Jesus, for the forgiveness of my sin. Thank you for hearing my prayer and bringing me into your forever family. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, please, no one looking. But if you just prayed and you meant it, would you do me a favor? With no one looking but me, would you just, in a moment, just slip your hand up and then take it down and by doing, saying, Ken, I prayed, I meant it, I asked Jesus to come into my life. Would you slip it up and just take it down wherever you are? God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you, ma'am. While our heads are still bowed, let me say to Everybody here. The fact that God did all of this for us. The songwriter said it this way. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. May you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, 
not be secret. May we live lives that are sold out to Jesus Christ. May we be attractive in a lost world. And may we live our lives daily so thankful to God for what he's done for us, what he's doing for us, and ultimately one day what he will do for us. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen.